Well, I've been wanting to make a short video, maybe not short, but wouldn't one that would take me all that long to put together. And uh, I got this engine up here that I bought at a uh, farm sale a couple years ago. It's got kind of an interesting story behind it, and uh, figured I'd share that with you all. And uh, the idea is to go through and get that thing running. And, but uh, first, got to get it off that shelf and uh, whew, zoom too much. Get it off that shelf with that, put it on that, and then uh, I can start tearing into it, and I'll tell you the rest of the story then. So I guess we'll start with what is this thing to begin with. This is a, I think, three horse uh, United. Three to four horse. There's the tag right there. Uh, United hit miss engine. Um, these things were used basically anything at a uh, Briggs and Stratton or a Honda motor is on today or an electric motor is on today. These things back in the day, back in the you know early part of the last century, uh, was the power for washing machines, lawn mowers, farm equipment, anything you could think of. Uh, if you could belt it up with a flat belt here, or some of the stuff was direct drive, like direct coupled right onto the shaft, um, these engines powered it. Uh, like I said, easiest way to think of it is anything like, like uh, Briggs and Stratton motors on today, one of these was on. These came in all kinds of sizes from wee small to uh, medium sized and then I got I don't know if I can zoom in on it there's a really big one over there so that's what it is it's a hit miss engine uh, the story I started to say that's interesting or at least is to me is this engine came from a farm that was just over the hill from a house I used to live in um, six seven years ago I'd remodeled a house uh, with my parents and uh, lived in it for a little bit out in the country, you know, nice nice setting uh, away from everybody had like five neighbors within the two mile radius and uh, old farmland and there was a farm on the other side of the hill from uh, where my house was in the valley and I always kind of had a hunch that maybe there was something in one of the barns, maybe not so much an actual engine but uh, just something engine related or remnants of of something that would have had an engine on it so uh, fast forward to last year um, auction company uh, had put the property up for sale uh, at the owner's request I think the uh, the old lady that had the farm had passed away and her children were uh, were selling it contents and everything so uh, property comes up for sale and it's a local auction company I go through them a bunch for all this junk that I don't need and uh, this is the ad for the auction uh, that's the barn that this engine was in and on this next page here this wee little place right there uh, all that little mode spot right there and that's a house uh, that was my house that I lived in uh, as you can tell that house is there that barn on the front cover is right there so literally I don't know three-quarter of a mile apart we used to take our four-wheelers and whatnot and drive around the back ridges around there and, and uh, always seen the the barn there's another picture of the barn right there beautiful house I mean old 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 home beautiful anyway it was in that barn right there went to the preview for the sale and uh, looked around Found the engine, because they had an old engine listed in the sale. Found it, looked all over uh, the engine, making sure everything was there. And I couldn't find the magneto that goes right here. 
Looked all over the place and couldn't find it. Looked in box lots all over the barn, underneath the barn. You know, some places where some old farmer might have stashed it. Couldn't find it, so I just assumed that it was gone to the sands of time. And uh, day of the auction comes, I get there. You know, of course, the uh, last thing to sell is this thing, which, whatever. Spend all day at an auction. It's not a bad day. And uh, I bid on it. I win it, obviously, it's sitting here, and I had to leave. I was covering for work, so I couldn't take it home with me right away and go back later that evening with a buddy to go pick it up. We get it loaded up on the trailer, and I'm looking in the water hopper, which is this thing here, and lo and behold, the mag that's supposed to be there was in there. So that was a nice little surprise. And I'm really shocked that somebody else didn't find it, but... Like I said, it was in the barn, it was underneath the hayloft, it was dark, and uh, I don't think there was a whole lot of interest in it. So, that made me happy. Uh, so that's the story on getting this thing, and uh, it's just just nice that they're still out there, places like that. When I first got into the hobby, uh, used to go to farm sales all the time, it would have two or three of these at it. Now anymore, it's all uh, uh, collectors that's had them for years, and the ones that are sitting on the farm are... Uh, few and far between they're still out there but but uh, you don't find it all that often and if uh, my preference is to buy them from uh, from a location that they originally worked on that uh, buying from the dealer thing or you know people buy and sell them uh, just doesn't doesn't do it for me it, it's not a good enough story if you ask me the stories in the hunt is what I enjoy uh, you know, going and finding it and seeing it for the first time, you know, open the doors up and cobwebs and light a day in 40 years and, you know, a literal barn find. So uh, that's the, the story. Like I said, it's from my neck of the woods where I, I lived at for a few years and uh, finally got my hands on it. Didn't know it was there the, to begin with until the place came up for sale. But uh, I've got it now and uh, I'm going to try to get it running. First order of business will be uh, getting this old piece of wood out from underneath of it. Now that's done, time to spray her down. Amazingly, a lot of this stuff is loose. Don't ask me how. but. For as rusty as this thing is, that's loose. That's loose. That's loose. The engine itself, the piston's really not stuck. So I'm going to take the fuel tank out. I don't want to crush this line if I don't need to. So in order to do that, this is the fill spout for the fuel tank. The fuel tank's actually down in there. It's kind of here. It's a square tank underneath. So in order to take that off, this has to come out and then I'll tilt the engine sideways and then pull the fuel tank out from the bottom. Amazingly, I think I can reuse it. Usually the bottoms are rotted out of it, but this one here appears to be pretty good shape. I'll leak check it. It's got some crud in it. I'll leak check it, and if I need to, I'll seal it or solder it. That's a pleasant surprise. I'll give you the plan of attacker. That way I'm not explaining everything as I go. This is the igniter. I'm going to take this out. It's got to get freed up. This 
push rod here that runs all the way back. That's got to get come out because it needs to move freely. I got to get this rocker arm freed up. These valves are free, but uh, I'm sure they're going to need reseated, uh, at least lapped in again. So I'll take the head off so I can get to the valves and get this freed up. Um, all this hubbub here needs to get freed up. Uh, this is what they call a detent lever. This is how it makes its hit and miss. Uh, these are the governor weights. They're stuck. There's two of them. Need to free them up. Um, this is the crank, connecting rod, and then pistons back in there. It's loose. It has turned, but uh, I hadn't done like a full revolution with it. Uh, I'm going to take that out. I'll take the flywheels off and out uh, by taking these main caps off here. Take them out, clean the bearings up, plus it'll give me a chance to clean shafts up and make sure there's no dirt and grime getting in there, ruined in the bearings. And then uh, before I do any of that, this cover's got to come off. And I'm feeling it's going to be a pain in the butt because I figure these probably won't come out all that easy. But that is the plan of attack. Those are the things that need to come off and uh, so I can get cleaned up and be able to put this thing back together and see if I can get it to run. Here's something to be worth taking note of. Before I take this cap off, I want to make sure I can get it loose and make sure that there are shims in here. You can kind of see them when I get that cap off, you'll see it better. But I don't want to lose these shims and lose the orientation that they're in, top and bottom. And uh, put them back, because I don't think this engine has a whole lot of hours on it. Um, put them back where they came from and that'll have my spacing from my bearings correct. Uh, same when I go and take the mains off. You can see the shims there. When I pull them out, sometimes they stick to, to the sub base, sometimes they stick to the main cap. They'll come out. You don't want to mix them up. Uh, they're set from the factory as long as, long as nobody's tampered with this. Uh, they should be pretty close. If they're not, you can take one out, tighten it up a little bit if it's too loose. But I uh, thought I'd uh, share that wealth of information.
Well, we're down to getting the piston out. Uh, I got it soaking with some PB Blaster. I want to take some uh, sandpaper and clean up that edge around there and put a block of wood in here and tap it out with a hammer. I don't think it'll come out too hard. That's always a good sign when they look nice and shiny like that. Like I said, I don't think this engine was run much. Wrist pin's kind of tight. I just think it's from lack of oil. So we'll get everything cleaned up and uh, show you a little bit of that process, getting some of the stuff freed up. But uh, I don't think it's going to take much. thing I'm worried about is uh, getting these governor weights freed up and not breaking them in the process but it actually kind of looks like that one's almost uh almost loose so see how it goes so in order to get these uh governor weights freed up i'm going to take them off here at the flywheel this uh slip collar here sliding collar needs to go back and forth in between this hub and this gear and then these weights are like L-shaped and they're like L-shaped and they need to pivot right there and they're stuck. So I think uh, taking them off is the best thing to do and freeing them up off the engine. That way I can free that up as well. But uh, I'd say the bearings are pretty good because this thing will coast forever. Now granted the caps aren't on them and all the linkages and stuff but... So another little trick on getting frozen parts freed up, heat your friend sometimes. These governor weights, I can tell they're not super seized just by how everything else on here is. So spray them down with some PB Blaster, a little bit of heat. You'll see the PB Blaster start bubbling around the places the parts are supposed to be moving. Once it does that, take your heat away, let it cool down, do that a couple times, and uh, with a little bit of effort, your parts will get freed up. I've already got these ones moving, so I know it works. Spray it down, it'll let that PB blaster soak in. And if this isn't too hot, this is the more stuck of the two. But as you can tell, it's getting freed up. So all I did was add a little fire and some PP blaster. And uh, well, the piece that was stuck freed up. So didn't take much, thankfully. Uh, this spring has seen better days. I can source a new one of them, so that's not a big deal. So it's been about a week since I worked on this. Got some parts that came in. Uh, the things I was saying, it was needed the gaskets and springs and things like that for the igniter. So I'm going to do an unboxing, you know, real exciting stuff from uh, Starbolt Engine Supplies.
tension spring, top spring, and this should be the gasket. Yeah. So what my problem is, is I uh, broke that off, focus. I broke that pin off, so I'm going to make one more attempt trying to push it out, and then uh, I'm going to drill it out with the old walker turner, if that don't work. Straight to the farmer fix here. Broken pin. Oh look, a nail. New pin. So that pin needs a slight taper on it. So we're going to chuck it up here in the lathe. Or it's already chucked up in the lathe, I guess. And uh, use a file and put a slight taper on this nail. And then uh, cut it to length. Remember kids, only you can prevent forest fires. And there you have it, a little bit of fire, PB blaster. Not so much fire that you're trying to melt the thing, but enough to get some heat in it to let the PB blaster soak in. I got some oil there and let it soak in. You're not trying to melt the thing. I know people are going to say that. Oh, don't use fire, you'll melt the bushings and yada, yada, yada. It's not getting that hot. It's enough to get the stuff to start penetrating and creeping in. And look, I couldn't even move that by hand before. And now I can just move it with my pinky. Lots of years of doing that. And don't get me wrong, I've screwed some things up by putting a little bit too much heat on them. But I've been doing this for about 20 years. So... Not an expert, but uh, confidently incompetent, you could say. I was able to get a gasket for the igniter. I'm going to have to make a head gasket. So that's what I'm getting ready to do. Got the gasket material here uh, underneath this really expensive paperweight. Flatten it out. And uh, I'm going to use a really janky compass thing. This thing here to uh, try to make circles. See how well this works out. That ain't working. All right, I got this hokey contraption rigged up. Zip tie and a pencil. I keep the pencil at a slight angle. Uh, I can get my circle here, I think.
There, finished product. For all you doubters. Here's the parts for the push rod and the igniter trip. Uh, I got them cleaned up. I didn't go super crazy on them, but uh, time to put all this back together. About to dive into the cylinder head here, give you a little run through what everything is. This J looking thing is what you call a mixer. Uh, today's standard would be a carburetor. That's a uh, choke essentially. There's a little spring right here that I got to replace to keep pressure on that, but you, you just manually set your choke how much you want. This is your needle valve for your metering of the fuel. You actually adjust it by hand. That is a check valve for pulling fuel out of the tank. How this thing pulls fuel out of the tank is when it's on the uh, suction stroke, it uh, is pulling air up through here. If you know much about a carburetor, it creates uh, uh, with a venturi in here essentially with the needle, uh, creates suction or vacuum and uh, pulls gas up into the tank. The reason, or into the uh, carb from the tank, the reason that this is needed, because if uh, that wasn't there, whatever was sucked up in would just drain back into the tank and it would have to suck out the tank through the, the fuel line every time. So put a check in there. So once the fuel is up in there, it uh, only has to pull it this way that far instead of pulling it a foot from the tank. Uh, rocker arm, just one rocker arm for the exhaust. The intake opens atmospherically, uh, meaning that when it's in the suction stroke, it the spring is weak enough that it actually pulls the valve open and uh, allows the air and the fuel mixture to come in. And then it closes seats and then you get your compression stroke and your fire, your power stroke, and then uh, your exhaust is timed. Um, so what I gotta do here is uh, loosen up the rocker arm because it is stiff, that needs to move freely. And um, I'm gonna take a look at the valve uh, seats and if they need it, I'm going to lap them in with a bit of grinding compound. Take this check apart. Uh, seat it, make sure it's seating good, and after that, we go uh, be able to get back on the engine. Ready to start putting this thing back together. I got everything cleaned up about as uh, good as I'm gonna get it. Like I said, this isn't a restoration. This is a just get it running. So things are not spick and span, but the things that need to be clean are clean. You know, the bearings and whatnot, little galleys as you could call them. Pistons cleaned up, cylinder, you know, crank journals, whatnot. First thing I'm going to do is put the piston back in and how you do it on these old engines, um, almost all of them. If you can see here, there's a little bit of a rounded rounded edge right there. So what that is, is you use that rounded edge to help guide in your piston rings. Uh, they didn't have, well they may have, but they didn't use uh, ring compressors on these. And a lot of the engines, you put them in through the back of the cylinder and you just uh, work the piston in and that little bit of a rounded edge 
uh, works the piston rings into the grooves on the piston and then you once you get through them all you slide the piston the rest of the way in and voila you know works kind of handy So you're probably curious as to how I know how to get this thing in time. If you've never been around these things, most of these uh, engines have timing marks on them. Those two little dots there will correspond with a little nub right there. So these two dots, once I find them again, go together like that. And that's how you know it's in time. Pretty simple. So here's where we're at, back where we started. Got the crank guard to put on, and minus the gas tank, it is all back together. So put these two bolts on, and it's pretty much buttoned up. Now it's not ready to run. I got some tinkering to do still. A couple other things I'll show you I got fixed. So here's where we're at. It's back together. It has compression. Uh, I didn't know it was gonna be this big of an issue. I got this gear here missing this tooth. This is the drive gear for the magneto that's supposed to go right here. I have the magneto, but I'm gonna have to take this bracket back off, press this pin out, and take this drive gear off to get this thing running. Uh, reason being, when I go to spin it over, the engine gets on to, or that gear gets on to where it's broke, and it wants to bind up, and I don't feel like breaking any more gears. So you can tell it stops. So, there's that issue. There's springs that go in here for the uh, governor. I don't have them. There's a spring that goes from here 
back to here, which I have, but I need to shorten it more because it's not it's not pulling this back like it should be. Uh, timing's still a little off. I think it's because of this here. It's letting it fire a little too early, which is a matter of me just adjusting this set uh, bolt up a little bit and delaying this here from tripping. As you've seen, there's a set of points inside the head and uh, how that works is they work like a set of points in a distributor. They click open with this little thumb that sticks down. They snap open, spark inside the cylinder head and or inside the cylinder and ignite whatever gas is in there. Um, I need to change the oiler out and once it's got a needle in it, that no oiler is not complete. And I need to put the uh, gas tank back underneath of it. Once all that's done, this thing should fire up. I'm in the process of patching up this uh, gas tank. I had a pinhole, well, can't really say a pinhole, pretty decent sized hole right here. Uh, I put some solder on it and I soldered that uh, nipple back in. Not the world's best solderer. Some will use this stuff called Red Coat Fuel Tank Liner. Uh, pretty good stuff. You seal all your spots on the tank with a little piece of tape, pour it in, swish it around, drain the excess off, and then let it set, and it'll basically line the inside of the tank. Uh, I've used it before, it works really good, especially on these old tin tanks that got a bunch of rust and crud inside it, seals all that stuff in, plus sealing up your uh, little pinholes. So like I said, I'm not the world's best solder. That red coat stuff did its job. You can see a little bit of it came out right there. A little bit more there. And then this is just a vent. That didn't really matter. But uh, tank's coated and should be good for quite some more time. Well, finally, she's all back together. Last piece of the pie for the puzzle. I guess it wouldn't be pie, you eat pie. Is that? Had a little bit of a problem finding uh, 5 16 copper tubing. All the hardware stores had quarter and 3 8 But the old parts store came through for me. They had a piece, one piece left, and I bought the last two compression fittings they had too. So, copper tubing goes to the gas tank, which I've already got gas in, checked it for leaks. Goes up into the little check valve, into this mixer, aka carburetor. I did already turn it over to make sure it would suck fuel and it wasn't leaking. Uh, so there is that. Um, so that, that works. The igniter works. Um, I did have it hooked up and uh, had a buzz coil on it, made sure it was making contact and it buzzed. So we're good there. Everything's together. I got grease in the grease cups. The cylinder's all nice and lubed up. Everything that needs to be oiled is oiled. Governor works. How this works is centrifugal force throws these out, these weights out, and uh, slides this collar here slide it more when it's running. Slides that collar which goes to this detent arm here as you can see it moves and then it goes over to this little catch right there and this is a hit and miss and how this makes hit and miss it fires once and then coasts until the governor says that it needs to says that it needs to uh, bear with me that it needs to coast and how that works is this little doohickey here comes down and catches on that little catch right there like that and will hold the exhaust valve open 
and then it'll coast through that. You'll see that when it's running. So that is the next step. Let's see uh, if my adjustments I made to the igniter here, I got it firing uh, about five degree, maybe seven degree before top dead center, which is five degrees where they should be. So see if uh, she'll fire up. Everything is way it should be. The only thing I really took out of adjustment was the igniter. Uh, exhaust valve should still be timed. It should just take right off in theory. So uh, let's see if it does. Before we fire it, I gotta hook up the uh, coil here. This is the ground. It should be grounded up here, but I couldn't get the screw out. So, have to make do. This is your terminal. It goes to your points. That does not go there. This goes there. White goes to the negative on the battery. This comes from the coil. And then the coil <coughs> goes to the positive of the battery. Once I get that hooked up, I'm just going to use a battery charger here for the power source. She should take off and run. Contact. Give everything a snort of oil. I like it doesn't have enough already. Never have too much. This is a choke plate. Essentially does what it says. It chokes it. Should suck, uh, should suck fuel up and take off. I have to take a couple cranks, but uh, we'll find out. Told you I thought I had dialed in already. I'm happy with that.
Well, if you made it this far, I hope you enjoyed what you watched. And you might consider subscribing to uh, this little channel I got going on. I got a lot of things that I'd like to, to do and show people. A bunch of projects. I think here's one of them. Plan on maybe doing a video on it at some point. Pretty neat truck. I do all kinds of things. I've got all kinds of stuff I need to get running. And uh, I enjoy making the videos. So if you enjoyed watching, please subscribe. Give it a like. I'm not a YouTube genius. People say it helps. So, about everything you're looking at here needs to uh, get running. And turn my static engine display into a running one. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching. As a great man once said, if the women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. <laughs>